Until recently, one of the least explored regions of the world was northeasterly Saudi Arabia, a parched desert across which hardy Bedouins drove their flocks in a never-ending quest for forage and water. In this vast desert without rivers, streams, or even springs, the few hand-dug wells were far apart. One fitful source of water was a cistern fed by drainage from occasional winter rains. It was built more than a thousand years ago on a caravan route from Baghdad to Mecca. Since those days, the customs and clothing of these wandering Bedouins had changed hardly at all. They eked out a meager existence in a lost world, a world that had stood still since before the dawn of Western civilization. On this same desert, through the summer and winter of 1947, motor caravans appeared. Camps were set up of a sort never seen here before. Small airplanes on supply and reconnaissance missions roared overhead, and sturdy trucks beat new paths on the desert. They were carrying Arabs and Americans, surveying a route for a great oil pipeline, a pipeline bearing on the recovery of Western Europe, the prosperity of the Middle East, and the stability of the world. Oil is scarce in many areas today. The cause of that scarcity is not a lack of reserves or a lack of production, but rather a lack of economical distribution. To conserve the supplies of the Western Hemisphere, the logical source of oil for Europe is the Middle East, for here are more proved and readily accessible reserves than in all of North and South America together, and the region is rapidly being developed. In eastern Saudi Arabia, the Arabian American Oil Company, called Aramco for short, discovered five major fields during the decade after the first commercial producing well was completed in 1938. The daily output by 1947 was over 400,000 barrels and steadily climbing. This posed the problem of transportation, how to get the oil in sufficient quantities and at reasonable cost to the areas of Western Europe where it was most needed. To reach the Mediterranean Sea, tank ships loading in the Persian Gulf had to make a slow and costly voyage of more than 3,000 miles through the Gulf of Oman, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Aden, the Red Sea, and finally the Gulf of Suez and the privately owned Suez Canal where a toll of 18 cents per barrel was imposed, amounting to $40,000 for the oil in each modern tanker. To increase the volume of oil delivered to Europe over this route, more tankers would of course be needed, plus expanded port and loading facilities. The companies owning Aramco decided that the practical alternative was a pipeline system from the oil fields of the Persian Gulf following a direct course across the Arabian desert to the Mediterranean, an overland distance of little more than a thousand miles, as against 3,500 miles by sea. This would effect substantial savings in steel, time, and expense. To construct and operate this pipeline, Trans-Arabian Pipeline Company was formed, TAP Line for short. International Bechtel Incorporated was to perform the physical work of construction in Saudi Arabia on the pipeline and its appurtenances. This amounted to nearly 80% of the entire project. A service organization was set up in San Francisco, and in March 1947, planning for the great project got underway. It was to be a major feat of logistics, for everything needed in the way of foodstuffs, housing, equipment, and supplies would have to be shipped nearly halfway around the world, from the United States to the Persian Gulf. Special equipment of all sorts was designed and built for work in the heat and sand and rock of the Arabian desert. More than 7,000 different kinds of items had to be requisitioned and purchased, not counting spare parts. And of these alone, there were over 30,000 different kinds. Hundreds of skilled men, engineers, office workers, machinists, mechanics, pipe fitters, welders, equipment operators, and many others had to be recruited in various parts of the United States and then carefully screened. They were advised about working conditions, 
and were hired only if they were eligible in all respects and prepared to serve in the Persian Gulf area for an employment contract period of 18 months. Then they took off from New York on an aerial journey across the Atlantic and across Europe to the Middle East. In two days, they got their first view of Saudi Arabia. Their plane landed at Aramco's headquarters, the town of Dharan. Thus began their adventure. In July 1947, with a temperature around 120 degrees, a little group of Arabs and Americans set up tents in the burning sand some 150 miles northwest of Dharan. Their task was to establish the main receiving port and supply depot for the whole Saudi Arabian portion of the tap line system. This base camp was called Ras El Mishab, meaning the camel driver's stick, after a nearby point of land. The site was more than a hundred miles from any permanent habitation. Ras El Mishab offered one of the few good roadsteads for freighters along the western coast of the Persian Gulf and it gave ready access to the Saudi Arabian portion of the pipeline route. Arab laborers and craftsmen were integrated into the project. Some had already learned trades with Aramco. Others were trained on the spot. Tap line policy from the very beginning was to employ as many Arabs as possible. Local clay fortified by cement was turned into bricks. These bricks were used by Arab masons for the construction of some of the permanent buildings. Rock from a nearby quarry was dumped into the shallow water of the gulf to make two piers for barges. Because of the shallowness of the water, ocean-going freighters could not approach closer than two and a half miles. At the outset, everything from canned goods to tractors had to be lighter to shore. Each barge could carry up to 200 tons of freight. Five or six barges were unloaded every day. Before long, the storage yard was well stocked. As more and more material arrived, construction at Ras El Mishab went on at a faster pace. Concrete foundations were laid for Quonset buildings to be used as shops and warehouses. Tanks were erected for the storage of water as well as fuel. As the work of construction went on, there was one conspicuous difficulty, language. At first, a few of the Arabs spoke a little English, but hardly any of the Americans knew a word of Arabic. However, patience and good humor on both sides soon brought understanding. The Americans adjusted themselves to Arabian customs, too. Five times a day, the Arab workers, all of them devout Muslims, turned toward the holy city of Mecca and said their prayers. Radio communication was of vital importance to the coordination of operations extending across a thousand desert miles. Base and outlying camps had to be equipped for two-way shortwave transmission. A few months after the first tents were pitched at Ras El Mishab, the camp became a modern little city with its own power supply, water and sewerage system, offices, shops, warehouses, laundry, mess hall, hospital, and comfortable quarters for its growing population, which now numbered nearly 500 Americans and 1,500 Arabs. In addition, it had its own airfield where large transport planes arrived and departed daily with mail, freight, and passengers. Each flight from Dahran brought more skilled craftsmen from America to swell the ranks of the pipeline builders. The recruits were taken in hand by personnel officers who drove them from the airfield a mile into camp. Each man was assigned to his living quarters in one of the barracks. His roommate was usually an old hand who could show him the ropes. The next step was a physical examination by the resident physician. Although the recruit had passed rigorous tests, 
and had been inoculated against various maladies before leaving the state, he still had to be found fit at the job site. Having met all the requirements, the recruits signed their employment contract and were welcomed into the fraternity of the Tap Line Project. The processing of recruits always wound up with an orientation lecture informally given by the personnel manager. He made it clear to them that they were guests in a country not their own and must abide by its laws and respect its customs. With a growing backlog of skilled manpower and the base camp well established, the tap line project was ready to begin receiving a very important kind of freight, pipe. Back in the United States, at the end of September 1947, molten iron poured from a blast furnace at the Geneva Steel Company mill near Salt Lake City. This was the birth of steel for the great Trans-Arabian pipeline. White hot slabs dropped from reheating furnaces and were conveyed through massive rolls that reduced them to plates of the required dimensions. The plates were delivered to the Maywood, California plant of Consolidated Western Steel Corporation. Here they were to be fabricated into the largest diameter pipe ever designed for the passage of oil. They came in four thicknesses, from a quarter of an inch to seven sixteenths, according to the pressures they would have to withstand in service. Fed into one end of the plant as plates, they would emerge as finished pipe joints ready for shipment. They passed through one great machine after another. They were leveled out, sheared and planed. Their edges were crimped. Now they were tipped into giant rolls, which gave them their first semblance of pipe joints. The plates, which had now become cylinders, were welded lengthwise by automatic machines. The outside seam was welded first. Then the inside seam was welded. The operator studied the glowing metal reflected in a mirror below the seam. They were placed in huge dies and hydraulically expanded to make them perfectly round and straight and to test and strengthen them. Now their ends were smoothed and beveled for field welding. A tap line inspector examined and measured each joint. No surface remained unseen. The inspector rode through on a dolly, examining the inside as thoroughly as the outside. Finally, joint after joint rolled down skids to a railroad siding. The joints were fabricated in 31 foot lengths and in two diameters, 30 and 31 inches. The smaller joints were nested within the larger ones, a new and ingenious idea for long-distance transportation of pipe. The pipe was moved 15 miles in gondola cars to a pier at Long Beach. Here it was taken aboard the Liberty ship William Tillman, whose destination was the Persian Gulf, 12,000 nautical miles and 45 days across the Pacific. Toward the end of December 1947, the Tillman dropped anchor as close as she could get to Ras El Mishab. She was the first of the pipe ships. Before the project was finished, there would be a hundred shiploads of pipe and other cargo delivered, totaling three billion ton miles. Half of the pipe joints were 30 inches in diameter. The rest of them were 31 inches, both having been nested with the smaller inside the larger, the two sizes of pipe took up no more space than would otherwise have been needed for one. The result was a 50% saving in shipping costs. Each barge carried about a hundred joints, roughly three-fifths of a mile of pipe. At the landing, a mobile crane lifted the pipe onto waiting trailers. 
and the loads were hauled to the nearby pipe yard. The pipe yard was more than just a place to store pipes. It had been carefully designed for the performance of a series of precise operations. From the trailer, the pipe was guided over ramps and rollers until it reached the denesting apparatus. A jig was fitted to the inner joint to hold it firm. Then the outer joint was drawn away and switched to another part of the plant to be dealt with separately. The joint was prepared for welding. Each end was clean. The joint moved forward to a lineup clamp. Already in place was another joint of the same diameter. When the two joints came exactly end to end, they were ready for welding. For the first time in the history of pipelining, an automatic welding machine was adapted for use in the field. Designed by Bechtel engineers, it averaged four or five complete wells per hour. Four of these machines were installed here. The 31-foot joints were united to form sections each 93 feet long. This operation cut down by two-thirds the amount of welding that would have to be done manually along the right-of-way. The 93-foot sections were now loaded from a stockpile onto big trailers. And the trek to the right-of-way began. More and more pipe was scheduled to arrive over a period of many months. In all, the tap line system would take 265,000 tons. Additional facilities for unloading the pipe were constructed. An installation called the Skyhook, originally developed in the Pacific Northwest as a means of moving logs out of mountainous country, was adapted here for the first time to bring cargo ashore from ships at sea. Made of heavy timbers, the towers rose 75 feet above their pile supports. There were two dozen of them in all, extending at 700-foot intervals over a distance of three miles from a half-mile inland to a platform mounted on piles in deep water out in the Gulf. From the towers, two strong cables were suspended from hooks or jacks. The cables, called skylines, were solidly anchored at sea as well as on land. Pipe unloaded from freighters onto the spacious deck could now be picked up by the skyhook machine and carried swiftly to shore. Three units comprising six nested joints of pipe, weighing eight or nine tons altogether, made up a load for the machine. The skyline served as overhead rails on which it could travel. Approaching a tower, it slowed down to a walk. Between towers, it gained a maximum speed of 35 miles per hour. The skyhook differed from all other aerial cableway systems in being self-propelled. The car was equipped with a gasoline engine, geared to run forward or backward. It pulled itself along by slack traction cables looped around driving wheels on either side. With three machines running in tandem and taking about 20 minutes for a round trip, the Skyhook could deliver more than a thousand tons a day from the sea island to the pipe yard. With Ross El Michaud completed and a backlog of pipe, equipment and supplies on hand, work on the pipeline itself could now go steadily forward. The Trans-Arabian Pipeline System, 1,068 miles of 30 and 31 inch pipe, beginning at the great producing center of Abcake, was to comprise two distinct divisions. The first was to be a 315 mile gathering line, owned and operated by Aramco. 
connecting present or potential oil fields up to a point known as Kesuma, where the oil would be metered. The second division would take off from Kesuma for its 753-mile run to the Mediterranean, and that would be tap line proper, an uninterrupted artery. By February 1948, clearing and leveling of the right-of-way began in the direction of Adcake from a point some 40 miles northward. This would become a proving ground for most of the new theories and the engineering for the greatest crude oil pipeline system ever undertaken. Through this area were huge dunes and tremendous masses of sand had to be pushed aside so the pipe could be laid as nearly level and as straight as possible. Thousands of cubic yards were disposed of every day. Drag lines as well as bulldozers were brought to bear. A number of poorly drained salt flats called sabahas had to be dealt with. Their soil was so moist and corrosive that the line where it crossed them would have to be supported above ground. A mobile pile driver about 40 feet tall, dubbed the loping camel, mounted on crawler tracks, was used to drive piles at 66-foot intervals through the soft, yielding soil of the Sabahas to firm material below. The piles went down in 10 to 20 feet. Then the tops were cut off and turned into cross pieces to support the pipe. These Sabahas existed only in the first hundred miles of the route. No more pile driving would be necessary farther along. On sandy stretches, where the pipeline was to be buried, a ditching machine inched along at a rate of about a mile a day. The cut it made was four feet wide and five feet deep. The machine was effective so long as it did not encounter hard rock. Here and there, just beneath the surface, were strata of limestone, which called for other equipment. The most spectacular was the giant ripper. It was a 20-ton Goliath, three times the size of the largest rippers ever seen before on construction jobs and its steel tooth was over six feet long. Behind the ripper came Arabs with wagon drills, sinking holes for dynamite where the rock couldn't be displaced otherwise. The powder monkey's job was one the Arabs took to very readily, for like people everywhere, they enjoyed setting off firecrackers. They were well instructed in safety precautions, however, and when the charge was set, everybody was well behind the firing line. The broken rock was cleaned out by a backhoe, whose operator never complained of lack of exercise. All told, more than two and a half million cubic yards of earth and rock would have to be moved before the project was done. Among the phenomena of Saudi Arabia is the dreaded Shamal, a violent northwest wind that sweeps across the open plains and over the dunes, whipping up curtains of dust and sand. Sometimes lasting days on end, its blinding fury immobilizes almost every living thing on the desert. Everything, that is, but the pipeline. It was in mid-February 1948 that the first load of pipe from Ras El Mishad came to the right-of-way. The truck trailer unit bearing the load was one of 150 such giants that would eventually be used on the project. The trailer carried nine or ten 93-foot sections of pipe weighing as much as 40 tons. Section after section was lifted off by big side-boom tractors which strung it along the right-of-way ready for laying. Following the pipe stringers came the lineup and welding crews. After the ends had been cleaned, the 93-foot sections were swung into place by side boom tractors. An automatic internal lineup clamp was brought into position. 
A conduit attached to the clamp ran through the section to be added. Switches at the end of the conduit controlled the clamp electrically. When the two sections were brought together, the clamp expanded inside the pipe until it gripped and held both ends in precise alignment. The stringer bead was applied to the joint. The internal clamp then traveled on its rollers through the pipe to its position for lining up the next section. And so the operation was repeated mile after mile. The pipe liners endured heat, wind, dust, flies, and the gnawing monotony of the desert. Behind the stringer bead men were follow-up welders who made additional passes with different sized rods to complete each weld and give it all the strength of the pipe itself. Wherever there was a change of direction of more than one degree in the line, anchors were installed. The pipe supports at these bends were either steel piles or massive concrete foundations. As the above ground portions of the line were erected, they became barriers to Bedouins with livestock, so ramps were thrown up at frequent intervals for the convenience of these desert travelers. There were no expansion joints, and the pipe was held stationary by ring girders in its above-ground portions, which were to make up about 40% of the whole tap line system. When the time came to tie in the final joint of the line between anchors several miles apart, the crew was faced with a delicate operation. An automatic acetylene torch was attached to the pipe to make a true cut. Then the two ends were quickly brought together so they could be welded before a change in temperature might cause them to buckle or drift apart. The union had to be made with the temperature of the pipe at approximately 90 degrees, since this was calculated to be the mean temperature of the pipeline in operation. It was a ticklish business. There was no margin for error. Signals had to be explicit and movement exact. At last, the stringer bead was applied. The critical moment was passed. But the crew could not yet relax. The pipe had to be promptly and carefully lowered into its final position. Then the ring girders were bolted together to hold it firm. In areas where the pipe was to be buried, the procedure was more conventional. The floor of the ditch had to be smoothed out and padded. Many of the Arabs doing this work were desert tribesmen, to whom a construction tool, even as simple as a hand shovel, was a novelty. Once the trench was ready, side boom tractors lifted the pipe and supported it in motion on roller cradles. Behind them came a self-propelled cleaning and priming machine. Its function was to clean off rust and scale and apply a coat of primer. Arab workers trailed it to touch up any spots that were missed. In the wake of the cleaning and priming machine came a coat and wrap machine. This ingenious contrivance, also self-propelled, coated the pipe with hot liquid asphalt from a big kettle, wrapped it with glass fiber, then coated it again. Now the pipe was ready to be put underground. Writhing like a giant serpent, it was lowered gently into its trench, but not to rest. Its life was only beginning, and its pulse would endure long after the shifting sands of the desert had hidden all trace of the recent activity. The great stockpile of pipe maintained at Ras El Mishad continued month after month to feed the plant where the 31-foot joints were automatically welded together into 93-foot sections. Day after day, the big pipe trucks 
each with its 40-ton trailer load lined up for inspection. Then they rolled out of the base camp and headed for the right-of-way. They were always on the move, and each succeeding trip was a little longer than the last. Besides the pipe went convoy after convoy of all manner of equipment, building materials, foodstuffs, and fuel. The truck-trailer combinations carried the tonnages of freight trains. The freight hauled overland for tap line was growing into a total of 150 million ton miles. Such loads could not be delivered with dependable regularity over mere trails, so men and machines forged ahead building and maintaining access roads that would stand up under constant heavy traffic. More than 1,200 miles of mainline highway and access roads were built, not only serving the immediate needs of construction and operation, but also opening up a through artery for commercial motor traffic for the first time across Saudi Arabia between the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean. It was a big job just to keep in repair the low-pressure tires used on all the trucks, trailers, and graders. There were the giant 50-ton truck tractors for hauling pipe, and hundreds of other vehicles of various types, besides all the earth-moving machinery. There was altogether about $18 million worth of equipment, all of which had to be maintained. At the outlying camps and at Ras el Mishab, staffs of mechanics and machinists were kept busy the clock round. New camps were set up at convenient intervals for the construction crews. All of the buildings could either be dismantled or picked up bodily and carted from place to place as needed. Each camp had its own self-contained plumbing system, so that men who came in from a hard day's work, tired and hot and dirty, could relax under a shower. And each camp had a well-run mess hall, where wholesome food was plentiful. Besides canned goods, there were frozen fresh fruits and vegetables and meats and even milk, all shipped in refrigerator boxes from the other side of the globe. To all of the men on the job and to all of the wayfarers in this arid land, there was a commodity of far greater immediate value than oil. And that, of course, was water. Fifty-two wells were drilled at strategic locations, and 40 of them brought in water. Most of it was brackish, but it was plentiful, and all of it was precious. A new water supply was thus created not only for future pump stations, but also for the Bedouins and their livestock. As one well after another was brought in, concrete troughs were set up. The word spread among the tribes. Soon, thousands of camels, sheep, and goats were brought to drink their fill. The new watering stations were regarded as permanent public utilities. Thanks to tap line, life became easier for man and beast in a harsh environment. In the spring of 1949, construction was started on the first of four big pump stations assigned by tap line to International Bechtel. Averaging 170 odd miles apart along the right of way, there were to be six stations for the entire pipeline system, all within Saudi Arabia. Each was to be an installation costing millions of dollars. At each, there were to be pumping units with a capacity exceeding 300,000 barrels of oil per day and accommodations and all facilities for a permanent staff of a score of Americans and a couple of hundred Arabs. In the tremendous program of transportation and construction, Arabs now outnumbered Americans by as many as 14 to 1. At the peak of activity, more than 14,000 Arabs were at work on the tap line project. Through on-the-job training, they were playing increasingly important roles. Most were employed through Arab subcontractors, who themselves had been set up in business by Aramco or tap line. Men who only a short while ago had never seen modern machinery were operating equipment of all sorts. The majority of these men, including many Bedouins, had been reared in an atmosphere that had changed little in a thousand years. When they came to work with Americans on the tap line project, every American had to become a teacher. The Arabs proved surprisingly adaptable. 
Not merely did they learn to do unaccustomed tasks, but they also managed to bridge a wide cultural and linguistic gap. But with all their technological training, their basic thinking remained inviolate, and they continued to abide faithfully by the precepts of the prophet. As originally planned, the pipeline was to have been pushed simultaneously from both ends. But the situation arising from events in Palestine delayed field work at the Mediterranean end until the fall of 1949. Here, the scenery was in sharp contrast to that of Arabia. The city of Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, was headquarters for the Western Division of Tap Line. And 35 miles to the south, the terminal site for the pipeline was hard by the town of Sidon, seaport of ancient Phoenicia, with its castle built by the Crusaders. The right-of-way passed picturesque hamlets perched on rugged hillsides, where terraces for the cultivation of figs, grapes, and cereals had been carved out by patient peasants countless generations ago. Eastward, from the Mediterranean, the route continued up hill and down dale. Along a certain stretch, one could look up at the silhouette of Beaufort Castle, another stronghold of the Crusaders. Right away went from Lebanon into Syria, then across the kingdom of Hashemite Jordan to Saudi Arabia. This comprised the Western Division, 214 miles whose construction was assigned by tap line to Williams Brothers Overseas Company. By September 1950, the forces of Williams Brothers were putting the finishing touches on the Sidon terminal. Sixteen 180,000 barrel storage tanks were erected at Sidon by Graver Construction Company, which was also building one of the pump stations in Saudi Arabia. At all the other stations, the tankage was put up by Chicago Bridge and Iron Company. The pipeliners were now tying in some of the last of the shorelines that would carry crude oil from the storage tanks to submarine lines for the loading of tankers. Meanwhile, along the right-of-way through Saudi Arabia, installations had arisen on the empty desert as if by the magic of the Arabian night. But the modern magic from which they sprang resulted from painstaking planning and the hard toil of hundreds of Americans and thousands of Arabs under the severest imaginable climatic conditions nearly halfway around the world from the sources of supply. All four of the pump stations whose construction had been undertaken by International Bechtel were now in the final stages of cleanup and testing. Soon each of these stations would be dispatching its daily quota of oil. Just to fill the tap line system, including the tankage and the line itself, would take six million barrels of oil, more than all the oil pumped in a day from all the wells in the United States. One of the most extraordinary of all engineering and construction projects ever carried out by private enterprise was now about to bear fruit. And well it might, for the cost would be in the neighborhood of $230 million. It was financed by Standard Oil Company of California, the Texas Company, Standard Oil Company, New Jersey, and Soconi Vacuum Oil Company Incorporated without government support of any kind. Of these companies, there are upwards of a half million private stockholders. The pipeliners were nearing the end of their trek. Month after month, perfectly coordinated teams of Arabs and Americans had been finishing more than a mile of pipeline every day. In areas where solid rock prevented economical trenching, the pipe was carefully settled into ring girders mounted on concrete piers. The below ground sections, after having been cleaned, primed, coated and wrapped, were effortlessly lowered in by skillfully manipulated side boom traction. Around the end of a section of pipe on the desert of northern Saudi Arabia, Four men gathered one day in mid-September. One was an executive of Trans-Arabian Pipeline Company. Two were executives of International Bechtel Incorporated, and the other was a construction superintendent. 
Theirs was an informal visit, but the occasion was significant. For they were inspecting the northwesterly end of a continuous line leading 854 miles from the oil center of Abcake. This was it. This meant for Bechtel the wind-up of another contract. Only the last few hundred yards of pipe remained to be coated and wrapped. All that lay behind was welded and tested and safe in the ground or mounted on piers, with oil already coursing through it from pump station to pump station. The machine ground steadily forward, and the Arabs and Americans guiding it performed their various jobs just as though this day were no different from any other. But suddenly their machine reached its goal. In a few days, the crew from the Mediterranean would be along with their end of the line to make the final tie-in. Now, through the Trans-Arabian pipeline system, flows the oil of Saudi Arabia to the storage tanks of Sidon. And into the blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea dip the submarine lines that load the oil into tankers, riding at anchor a mile from shore. The initial maximum output of the line was 300,000 barrels per day, but with an extra half dozen pump stations, it could be increased to a half million barrels. Through government royalties, through education, and through new industrial activities, the Arabs are benefiting enormously from tap lines. At the same time, the Aramco and tap line organizations and their investors stand to be rewarded for their courage and imagination. And finally, the ready supply of oil made available by the Trans-Arabian pipeline system will hasten the reconstruction of Western Europe and strengthen it for peace.